So in our previous videos, we covered vaccines that targeted mostly viral infections. In this video, we're going to cover vaccines that protect against bacterial infections. So uh, there's a little drawing of a bacteria there. And there are two strategies used to target bacterial infections. One involves trying to get the immune system to generate antibodies that would bind molecules on the surface of a bacteria. What would these antibodies be good for? Well, antibody binding to the surface of bacteria would promote opsonization, antibody-mediated opsonization for macrophages, for example. Um, these antibodies would also promote the classical pathway of complement activation. So these antibodies would be good for fighting bacterial infections. There's another strategy used to target bacterial infections, and that is targeting the bacterial toxin. There are some bacterial infections, which we'll cover in this video, um, where the toxin released by the bacterium is actually worse than the bacteria itself. The bacteria itself actually doesn't harm um, the individual. It's the toxin released by the bacteria that harms the individual. In those cases, um, we can try to get the immune system to generate antibodies that target the toxin. And if you have antibodies binding the toxin, uh, again, this will trigger uh, antibody-mediated opsonization and uptake of the uh, toxin. It might uh, um, trigger clearance of the toxin uh, the, out of the body, complement fixation toward it, which would again promote more opsonization. So these are the two main strategies, and we'll cover uh, some of those in this video. So let's start off with some vaccines. Um, just like with viral vaccines, there are bacterial vaccines that are live attenuated vaccines. So these would involve injecting live bacteria into a person's body, uh, bacteria that are weak, that cannot cause disease, um, but would provoke an immune response. Uh, these bacteria would be get uh, would be taken up by dendritic cells, macrophages, they'd be recognized by B cell receptors, and provoke an immune response. Uh, not a lot of these vaccines, because uh, it is difficult to engineer a bacteria that is harmless in uh, humans. So the tuberculosis vaccine, uh, not used commonly in the U.S., used more commonly in Europe, involves injecting individuals with a bovine version of the tuberculosis bacterium. There's another version of salmonella, which is uh, doesn't uh, cause disease in humans, can somewhat replicate in humans, and can provoke somewhat of an immune response. These are not too com these vaccines are not very commonly given. Um, vaccines that uh, exist also to kill the bacteria. So just like with killed viruses, inactivated viruses, there are killed or inactivated bacterial vaccines. So there's a vaccine for cholera, which involves chemically treating the um, bacterium or heat treating the bacterium or both. And that would yield a killed dead bacteria, maybe bacterial products, and that can be injected into the body and provoke an immune response, hopefully um, stimulating both B cells and T cells to generate an immune response. Uh, a killed bacterial vaccine um, also exists for uh, Yersinia um, pestis, which is the causative agent of the plague. Um, and lastly, there is a vaccine for Bordetella pertussis, the bacteria that um, promotes a whooping cough, although we're going to see that there's actually a more common vaccine for Bordetella pertussis uh, you, uh, made using a different mechanism. So let's talk about this types of vaccine that would be, uh, that could be used to generate antibodies against toxins from certain bacteria. So Clostridium tetani, uh, that is the bacteria that causes tetanus. Uh, if you've ever gotten a tetanus shot, this is what's in the tetanus shot. It is um, something that's going to help you defeat the tetanus toxin. So the Clostridium tetani releases this protein called the tetanus toxin. That is what will kill you if you get this bacteria in your body. The tetanus toxin um, interferes with motor neurons. Specifically, it interferes with motor neurons' ability to inhibit muscle contraction. So when you want to contract your muscles and when you want to relax your muscles, you need to send signals to your muscles. 
the tetanus toxin interferes with these signals. So it actually inhibits uh, um, the, well, it inhibits inhibiting muscle contraction. So you end up hitting muscles that can't contract. And sometimes tetanus is known as lockjaw. One of the first symptoms of bacterial infection by C. tetani is your muscles in your jaw can't relax. If you can't relax the muscles in your jaw, you can't open your jaw. Your jaw is locked. You're going to have a hard time eating with your jaw uh, not being able to be relaxed and open up. Um, so tetanus or lockjaw, uh, not a good thing. Eventually, uh, the tetanus toxin will kill an individual because it will affect the ability to relax the muscles involved in breathing. Again, if for you to breathe, you need to contract and relax the muscles of your diaphragm and your rib muscles. And these individuals will not be able to relax those muscles and will not be able to ventilate properly. So tetanus, very deadly due to uh, this toxin produced by the bacterium. Um, C. diphtheriae um, causes diphtheria, and there's a toxin that, again, comes out of the bacteria. Diphtheria toxin inhibits protein synthesis. Now, this would be bad for uh, your body, definitely inhibiting protein synthesis. Um, so it can lead to death as well. Uh, lastly, Bordetella pertussis, which is the causative agent of whooping cough, um, it actually also releases a toxin known as the pertussis toxin. Uh, it is not clear if the pertussis toxin plays a major role in the production of the cough. What is clear is that the pertussis toxin plays a major role in inhibiting the immune response. So whooping cough is notoriously difficult to rid uh, out of the body. So, um, or I should say that Bordetella pertussis is notoriously difficult to rid. Um, the immune system has a very hard time getting rid of it, one of the reasons why is it evades the immune system very well. And one of those reasons is because of the presence of this toxin uh, released by Bordetella pertussis, known as the pertussis toxin. So these are three bacteria that release toxins. So it turns out that we have an ability using immunizations to generate antibodies against the toxins. And that is one way to prevent uh, not bacterial infection, but prevent damage to the body by the bacteria. So let's look at one uh, type of these uh, vaccines. If you've ever heard of gotten a DPT vaccine, um, what this vaccine contains is toxins in it. Now, are you being injected with toxins? Are they going to kill you? Uh, no. These are the toxins that are purified from diphtheria and tetanus, the tetanus toxin and the diphtheria toxin. They've purified the toxins from these bacteria and they've treated them chemically with formaldehyde, a cross-linking agent which inactivates the toxin. So what you're actually being, being injected with are uh, what's called a toxoids. They are non-toxic versions of the toxin. So the DPT vaccine contains toxoids, um, specifically from the, the diphtheria toxin and the tetanus toxin. The per, uh, so, and these would be considered subunit vaccines because you're not being injected with the whole pathogen. You're just being injected with a piece of the pathogen, specifically the toxin piece. Uh, the P stands for the pertussis, Bordetella pertussis. In the uh, original DPT vaccine, the pertussis actually was a um, killed or inactivated pertussis bacterium. So the DPT vac vaccine had toxoids, uh, diphtheria and, toxin and, and uh, tetanus toxoid, plus inactivated, killed Bordetella pertussis bacteria. So the goal of this vaccine would be to generate antibodies to the diphtheria toxin, the tetanus toxin, and antibodies to the surface of the Bordetella pertussis um, bacteria. And more recently, the uh, vaccine has been changed to something known as Tdap or DTAP. And in this vaccine, you still have the diphtheria toxin and the tetanus toxin that has been in inactivated using formalin, so now we call them toxoids. And the uh, pertussis uh, part of it, now you see the letter A, the A stands for acellular pertussis. So we're not using the entire pertussis bacterial cell in this vaccine. We're using subunits of pertussis, specifically the um, pertussis toxin inactivated again with um, formaldehyde. 
So the acellular version of the pertussis toxin has actually fewer side effects than the pertussis uh, killed inactivated pathogen that was being injected into individuals in the DPT vaccine. So um, the so the DTP DP, DTP vaccine uh, has been replaced mostly uh, by the Tdap vaccine or the DTAP uh, depends on uh, where you read about it. Uh, and so you're, in, you're making antibodies to toxins. Um, these vaccines seem to be, need to be re-administered about every 10 years because it seems like the, for some reason, not very clear, uh, the antibody response decreases to a point where it's not protective um, after 10 years or so. So um, when you go to see a clinician and they ask you, when's the last time you had your tetanus shot? it is because they need to make sure that you're making enough antibodies to these toxins so that they won't, uh, these bacteria won't get in your body and the toxins won't uh, get reach a point where they will do damage to your um, organs, uh, organ systems. Um, and this is why we get uh, booster shots every 10 years for the DPT vaccines, or if we step on a rusty nail um, or get a, a major cut, um, we get a booster shot, the DPT booster, just to protect us from uh, the possibility of getting um, any of these bacteria with their toxins in our bodies.